Good evening, and welcome to the Network for Responsible Public Policy. I'm Jenny Smith-Wilson, a trustee of NFRPP. We're so happy that you've joined us tonight to discuss the role of big money in U.S. elections. The Network for Responsible Public Policy connects people with thought leaders who educate and inspire. Tonight, we are so fortunate to have with us a distinguished group of campaign finance law experts from the nonprofit Campaign Legal Center. For more information on our distinguished speakers, please visit our website where you'll find their bios along with our extensive library of videos of past programs. I also encourage you to visit the Campaign Legal Center's website, campaignlegal.org, to learn more about the work of this important organization. No doubt this conversation will generate questions. Please type those in the Q&A box. Erin Klopak, Senior Director of Campaign Finance at CLC, is our moderator. Erin, I'll turn it over to you now to introduce the panel. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks so much, Jenny. Um, we so appreciate the invitation to talk to all of you um, this evening and share some of the work that we're doing at CLC and uh, the issues that we're paying attention to. Uh, Campaign Legal Center is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local level. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process, and we believe that our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. I'm really excited to be joined by several of my distinguished colleagues from CLC this evening to talk about the hugely important and influential role that money plays in our system of determining who holds power in our federal, state, and local government. We'll talk about the basic rules governing our system of financing electoral campaigns, and we'll explain how loopholes and lax enforcement are increasingly being exploited by wealthy special interests to harm voters by both depriving ordinary citizens of a meaningful voice in the political process and by concealing key information about who is wielding outsized influence by spending huge sums of money to elect their preferred candidates and enact their preferred policies. Importantly, these problems are not without solutions and our speakers will also share some success stories and examples of progress, including a court decision issued just yesterday um, that we are pursuing through innovative strategic litigation and actively pursuing um, policy developments in the states and localities. Um, but before we start a discussion, I just wanna go over a few quick housekeeping matters. Um, as Jenny mentioned, if you have questions during the conversation, please use the Q&A tab to submit them. Um, we have saved, we'll make sure to save some time at the end and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. But not to worry, if we don't get to your question, um, we're going to share with you a link, um, or an email address, I should say, that's info at campaignlegal.org. And I think um, someone's gonna post it also in the Q&A. Um, so feel free to send your questions to us at that email address if, you, um, if we're not able to get to them this evening, and we will be happy to follow up with you that way. Um, and now I'm really excited to introduce our panel. Joining me this evening are my esteemed colleagues, Saurabh Ghosh, Kevin Hancock, and Aaron McKean. Saurabh is Director of Federal Campaign Finance Reform at CLC. He leads our efforts to uncover campaign finance violations, file complaints seeking administrative enforcement, and pursue legislative and regulatory reforms to strengthen and ensure the consistent and robust enforcement of campaign finance laws. Um, Kevin Hancock is Director of Strategic Litigation at Campaign Legal Center, and he litigates to protect voting rights, ensure fair redistricting, and reform the campaign finance system. Um, Aaron is our Senior Legal Counsel for State and Local Reform, and he works with state and local partners to develop and advocate for campaign finance reforms that lift the voices of every voter and lead to a more transparent democracy. Thank you so much, Saurabh, Kevin, and Aaron for joining us this evening and for this conversation about a topic that I'm sure will be increasingly on people's minds as we get deeper into the election season. And with that, let's get started. So I think 
Saurabh, I'm going to start with you. But before we get into the sort of pressing problems of our campaign finance system, I think it would be helpful for everyone if you could sort of explain the basic ground rules of how our system of financing electoral campaigns works, or at least how it's supposed to work. Sure. Thanks, Aaron. And thank you for having me on tonight. Um, so I think a good place to start when thinking about and talking about campaign finance is why do we even have laws that regulate campaign finance? What's really at stake? And uh, just to put things in perspective, you know, the uh, estimates for total spending in the 2020 election were as high as $14.4 billion. And the 2022 midterms, uh, the estimate was $8.9 billion in, in overall spending. And both of those figures broke new records for um, you know the election of that sort, a presidential election or a midterm election. Uh, and as far as 2024, uh, we're on pace to break the, the previous record set in 2020. Um, and of that spending, you know, since uh, since the Citizens United decision in 2010, which you're going to hear a bit more about, uh, the proportion of outside spending has continued to increase pretty much every election cycle. So, you know, to give you a sense, again, of the scale, in 2012, total outside spending on independent expenditures or, or messages that contain express advocacy telling folks, you know, vote for someone or don't vote for someone, uh, the amount spent was $1 billion in 2012. In 2016, that increased $1.38 billion. And in 2020, it more than doubled to $2.88 billion. So, you know, there is a tremendous amount of money that is raised and spent, a lot of it by uh, the so-called independent or outside spending groups uh, that we're going to talk a bit about tonight. Uh, and that really puts, I think, into focus why we need rules, uh, laws that uh, regulate this industry that sees so much money being raised and spent. And, and money raised and spent for a very particular and sensitive purpose, and that is uh, deciding who is going to serve in our government, who who is actually uh, going to have you know the the power to shape policies and and drive outcomes through our government. So you know, with that said, I want to sort of lay the table with three big picture goals that campaign finance laws serve, uh, and those three are transparency, accountability, and essentially limiting the power of uh, special interests. And uh, basically, I, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but, you know, transparency, as for starters, is uh, pretty much what it sounds like, that the money raised and spent in elections is done so transparently. So voters uh, have a right to know and can easily access information about who is spending money to influence elections, whether that be money that they're giving to candidates or political parties uh, or to these outside groups. Uh, and then how how those uh, candidates, parties, or outside groups are spending that money. And that sort of naturally bleeds into the second issue, which is accountability. Uh, the public donors are giving this money to candidates or committees or outside groups for a specific purpose. And um, they are entitled to know how it's being spent, whether it's being misused. And, and in cases, you know, where... Um, where it is being misused to to see some accountability for those actions. So you know, candidates and PACs and and outside groups uh, that are asking for money uh, need to be held accountable for how they're using it. And then the third piece is perhaps the one that we'll spend the most time really thinking about uh, with tonight's discussion, which is you know the big money and the special interests that are that are providing it. Uh, how do we? How does campaign finance law seek to limit? the influence, the access, and the, the power that special interests wield over the election process, over the, the political process. Um, you know, it's, it's basically a question of, do we have a system of laws that, that exercises some check on uh, the ability for money to, to buy more and more of that influence and access? Or, or do we have uh, in essence, an ability to make sure that, you know, everyday Americans are still able to have their electoral voice heard. Thanks, Saurabh. 
so it sounds like what you're saying is we do have some restrictions or you know laws in place that are designed to achieve these goals and Kevin I'm hoping you can maybe talk a little bit about what some of those laws are and then if we have them why is it the case that we're here talking about people and, and groups being able to um, you know spend so much money or do so in secret why aren't the laws that we have enough I'm sure, and and thanks, Aaron, and and thanks so much for having me here tonight. Um, so that the structure of those laws, um, which you know, it, the act that enacted these laws that that are in place today is called the Federal Election Campaign Act, and that law was passed largely in the wake of the Watergate scandal, which in part was a campaign finance scandal. Um, you had a, a very reform-minded Congress, which at that time uh, enacted these laws and also created an agency to enforce them. Um, and in very broad strokes, what FICA does is it, it provides for transparency, right? It, it, it requires disclosure of campaign finance spending, and we can get into the nitty gritty of what that means. But, um, and it also limits contributions um, in many cases. And um, at least at the outset, it also limited what we call in campaign finance parlance expenditures. So spending by folks uh, intended to influence federal elections. Um, and so in the 70s, you had this framework put into place. Um, but the, the story of how we got from there in the 70s when FICA was passed to where we are today, um, I largely like to think of it as a bit of a three-part story. Um, and so the first part of it is uh, the Supreme Court once said in a, an important campaign finance case that money like water will always find an outlet. Um, and, and it really is true. You see this cycle in campaign finance of Congress passing regulation to limit uh, spending and require disclosure. Donors and candidates finding ways to circumvent and get around those rules. Um, scandal and then more regulation from Congress meant to address that scandal. Um, and so it, it ends up being pretty cyclical. Um, the second important part of that story is the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court over the years since the 70s has made it far easier for money to find outlets in the laws. Um, the court in a series of important cases over the last few decades has struck down important portions of the campaign finance laws under the theory that the regulation of money and politics infringes on the freedom of speech protected by the First Amendment. Um, broadly speaking, in these cases, what the court has done is it's weighed First Amendment values um, of ensuring speech about politics and elections, ensuring that it's robust and wide open, versus the government interests in regulating campaign finance. Um, and so some important things that the court has decided over the years, which has led to more deregulation, is one that money is speech. Um, the court has equated electoral spending with speech. And that's important because it means the First Amendment's at play here. Anytime you limit money in uh, elections, you're limiting speech according to the Supreme Court. Um, now, how much of an effect is it having on speech? Well, it depends. It depends on whether you're talking about contributions. So if you give money to a candidate uh, to support them, um, the court has said that is symbolic speech. Uh, that is that is implicates the First Amendment. Um, or if you're making an expenditure, say you buy an ad in the New York Times yourself to support candidate X, um, the Supreme Court has equated that with that spending with pure speech. Um, <clears throat> and so has really come down hard on a, attempts to limit such expenditures. Um, on the other side of the balance, you have the government interests in regulating campaign finance. The Supreme Court has said that equalizing the playing field is not a legitimate interest in regulating money and politics. So government can't limit the spending of some to amplify the voices of those who have less money. The court has struck down all attempts to do that. And instead, the court has said the only legitimate reason to limit spending in elections is to prevent what we call quid pro quo corruption, or in a sense, bribery, right? If if the point, if the government goal isn't to try to prevent bribery, then there's no justification for limiting spending. Um, the other piece of this is the court has said that disclosure is okay under a theory of, well, we've got to inform voters of who is spending on candidates before an election so they can use that information in how they vote. 
Um, <clears throat> so in general, expenditure limits are not okay. You can't uh, tell an individual you can't spend money on an ad in the New York Times supported a candidate, but the court has okayed contribution limits. So laws limiting the amount of money that you can give to say a presidential candidate. Um, there are some special cases that are important. Um, so corporations are one of those special cases. It used to be that government could limit corporations from making any expenditures at all or, or spending any money in our elections. Um, but an important sea change in this area of the law happened with Citizens United in 2010. And that tends to be the Supreme Court case that, that everyone has heard of in this field. Um, so what did Citizens United do? So it struck down any limits on corporate independent expenditures. Um, now, why? Uh, the court said, well, if spending by corporations on elections is truly independent, meaning they're not coordinating at all with a candidate, say, asking the candidate, how do you want me to spend this money or what should I buy or what should my ad say? Um, if that's the case, then that kind of spending can't cause corruption, period, as a matter of law. Um, end of story, regardless of what the facts are. Um, and so that has led to two really important changes since 2010. Um, it's led to the rise of what we call super PACs. Um, so if you want to know what a super PAC is, it's important to know what a regular PAC is. Um, a regular PAC is a political committee. And then essentially that means it's a group that has the primary purpose of influencing elections. Those groups make both contributions to candidates and make expenditures. Um, and as a result, if you're going to give money to a PAC, that money will be limited because that money could go on to a candidate. A super PAC is a PAC that has agreed to not make any contributions to candidates at all. All they do is make independent expenditures. And as a result, the courts have said, well, all they engage in is this supposedly non-corrupting activity. And so there's no justification for limiting contributions to such groups. So if you wanted to give a billion dollars to a super PAC, you could do it because according to the Supreme Court, there is no way for that money to corrupt the electoral process. Um, the second important effect of Citizens United is it's led to the rise of nonprofit electoral spending. Um, nonprofit groups are not PACs. Um, they are nonprofits under the IRS uh, tax code. Um, and so they don't have to disclose their donors in the same way that PACs do. And so they've become these attractive vehicles for donors to give money to for spending in elections, because ultimately their, their names will not have to be released to the public when that spending is made. And this is a, a very controversial area because um, many advocate that these nonprofit groups are really PACs that are just refusing to register with the FEC. Um, and so that's the Supreme Court, Court part of the story. The third part of the story is the Federal Election Commission. Um, the FEC, again, created in the 70s, along with these laws, was charged with enforcing these laws and administering them and interpreting them. Um, the agency performs a lot of important fu functions, including acting as a clearinghouse for all this campaign finance disclosure information. Um, the agency conducts investigations, um, can implement enforcement actions to enforce the law, um, and importantly, can promulgate regulations that um, kind of interpret the statutes and get into the granular level and nitty gritty of how the law will apply to everyday activity. Um, the agency is structured in a way in which it's bipartisan. Um, there are, practically speaking, there are three Republicans and three Democrats. And for any action to occur, four members need to agree. So by definition, the commission can only act in a bipartisan way. That was meant to ensure that enforcement of law would be bipartisan. Um, I think an admiral goal on the part of Congress. The downside is it leads to a lot of gridlock and deadlock. Um, often the Democrats and the Republicans don't agree on how to interpret the law. Um, and so that means that there are a lot of important areas of the law where um, the commission has not very strictly come down in terms of ensuring that the laws passed by Congress are enforced in a, in a strict way that would ensure more disclosure or um, ensure less coordination by these groups that are kind of spending on behalf of candidates. And Saurav and his team have written an important report on this coordination issue. And I know that's something that, that he's gonna get more into in a moment. Um, but those are the kind of three pieces at play here in terms that explain how we got from 
where the law was when it was first enacted to where we are today. Thanks so much for that helpful um, explanation of sort of how we got here. And so now, Saurav, I'm hoping that you can sort of explain, now that we're here, what's happening? How are groups taking advantage of the way that the system is working right now? And, and tell us more about this coordination issue that Kevin just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I'll start there, actually. The the issue that Kevin is had mentioned about coordination is uh, really one of the, the biggest problems in campaign finance today. Um, so, you know, so in the Citizens United decision, the Supreme Court said that all of this spending was uh, not corrupting uh, because it's being done independently. It was a basic assumption of the decision that the spending would be independent of candidates and the political parties. So uh, the issue is that since Citizens United, um, sort of day by day, year by year, it seems that super PACs and the special interests that finance them have actually been able to coordinate with uh, candidates and the political parties uh, on a fairly routine basis. Um, the report that we put together was designed to serve as um, a catalog of, of various tactics and, and strategies that are often used to facilitate that kind of coordination. Um, some of the, you know, some of the types of coordination are uh, efforts to uh, to use um, what what has been permitted uh, to evade the prohibition on actual coordination. And, and I think the best example of that is a practice known as red boxing. Um, the FEC has long maintained that uh, a candidate or political party committee cannot um, communicate instructions or, or specific guidance uh, to a super PAC in some kind of uh, private communication. So it would be a violation of the laws to um, you know, for a candidate to pick up the phone and call up a super PAC and say, I I really like you to run ads that hit my opponent on these points and emphasize, you know, these positions that I have or something like that. Uh, but there's an important caveat, which is that the FEC has long maintained that that kind of information is perfectly fine if it's communicated in a public setting. So this practice of red boxing is essentially candidates and parties putting on, on websites or other public platforms what they would like super PACs to use in their messaging. Um, and if that seems absurd and, and uh, a, a very uh, patent attempt to uh, do what the Supreme Court said that you can't, you know, you're, you're thinking about it in the same way I am uh, and my colleagues and I. Um, so, you know, that is a, a, something that we describe as effectively coordination. Uh, but it's an area that the FEC has said they will not uh, they will not treat that as coordination. And so, you know, it's it's just one of several tactics um, through which super PACs are, are working more and more closely with uh, candidates' campaigns. Uh, I think a, a, another good illustration from this uh, election cycle, uh, although it feels like a long time ago, uh, was the interaction between the super PAC Never Back Down and the presidential campaign of Ron DeSantis. Uh, this, you know, this is the kind of uh, relationship that I think could become more common and really exemplifies the problem. So Ron DeSantis's campaign uh, was essentially outsourcing a great deal of the day-to-day -day operations and groundwork for, for his candidacy to the super PAC never back down. And uh, this this really wasn't subtle at all. I think in uh, in terms of just the state of Iowa, which of course is one of the crucial early uh, caucus states, um, the never back down super PAC was actually responsible for holding events in uh, 90 plus of, of the 97 or 98 Iowa counties. That uh, that DeSantis visited during his sort of rampant campaigning there, um, and again, there's there's an FEC rule that says a candidate can appear at a non-federal event, so so essentially a, an event hosted by a super PAC 
as a uh, a featured guest. And so sort of using that, uh, what was once a fairly limited uh, exception built into the FEC regs, uh, we now see someone like Ron DeSantis running for president, but having the, the vast majority of his events being paid for and organized and put together by a super PAC. Uh, basically, that, that sort of setup completely undermines the notion that this uh, organization that can receive unlimited amounts of money and money from corporations and billionaires, uh, it, that it's independent in any meaningful sense. Um, that's why we we titled the report uh, the the illusion of independence because you know despite the Supreme Court's uh, belief and, and assumption in its decision uh, that that independence that they uh, relied on has actually turned to be a complete fiction. Um, and the FEC really has a hand in this as well. As, as Kevin mentioned, it's an agency that has a very important responsibility, um, but we see that it's, uh, at least in recent years, utterly failed in that responsibility. Uh, we did a survey of cases where uh, someone alleged coordination had occurred between a super PAC or, or other outside group and a candidate or, or party committee. And since Citizens United, we found not a single enforcement matter where the FEC actually enforced the law and said, you know, there were coordinated communications um, or, or some sort of coordination had been the basis of a super PAC spending. And that's obviously a huge problem because if the FEC isn't enforcing the law, groups are going to continue pushing the envelope and saying, well, let's work more and more closely with uh, the candidates and, and the parties uh, because ultimately there's very little risk for them. There's there's no one actually um, maintaining and enforcing the law. The other piece, aside from coordination, that I'd say is a big challenge and, and a way in which the legal landscape is, is being exploited these days is, uh, is something Kevin mentioned as well, the secret spending or dark money problem. Uh, I think the, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest sources of uh, dark money are these uh, C4 or, or other 501C nonprofit entities, which, you know, by virtue of being a nonprofit, they are not required to disclose their donors. Um, and so as a result, the public, the, the voters are not able to, uh, to tell where uh, their, their money is coming from. Uh, and yet at the same time, these are groups that are spending directly on elections. They are often paying for ads that uh, advocate for a candidate or against a candidate. Uh, and, and in recent years, you know, they are actually often providing a great deal of the funding for super PACs. So, you know, even though super PACs, like any political committee, have to disclose where they get their money from, uh, it's not a meaningful disclosure. It doesn't really create transparency if what they're disclosing is that they got all or virtually all of their money from uh, a C4 group that doesn't disclose its donors. Um, so that's a that's a very big problem, and it sort of facilitates uh, all of the other concerns with special interests, because uh, if somebody wants to generously back a candidate but do so secretly, um, you know, that that pathway, unfortunately, exists where, uh, and, and this is often one of its biggest selling points, uh, somebody that sets up a super PAC and a sister C4 group will often, you know, we've seen cases where they approach prospective donors uh, and say, you know, if you want to give openly, there's the super PAC, but if you're not comfortable with that, give to the C4 and it'll support the same candidate. And that just utterly defeats the, any any real notion that we have transparency in our system. And that just fuels the special interest capture and, and influence problem. Um, thank you for that explanation. So, you know, between what Kevin described and, and what you just talked about, Sarav, it sounds like, um, you know, things aren't working as they're supposed to be working at the federal level. Um, Aaron, can you tell us how thing, what's going on at the state and local level? Are we seeing the same kinds of problems or are there different issues that are popping up um, when we get down to the states? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the, all this setup has been very helpful for talking about things at the state and local level, just because so much of it starts at what's happening at the federal level. Um, one of the things I keep reminding myself uh, is that 
sometimes the practices that we see at the federal level just trickle down to uh, state, election, state elections or local elections. And that's always something to keep an eye on. Um, and the red boxing one is a perfect example. Um, one of the things that, right, you know, Sarab has identified uh, red boxing as his problem for federal elections, and it goes back years where you can find examples of it. Uh, but we've also seen in recent years where state elections uh, have been, you know, pulling those kind of tactics, right? We've seen them in Rhode Island in a Democratic primary, where a super PAC all of a sudden came in and uh, was spending millions of dollars in response to a very clear red box on a candidate's uh, campaign website. And, you know, the question was, all right, what are we going to do about this, right? You know, did the law actually address it at the state level? Uh, and if it doesn't address it, how do we fix it? Um, and then the the additional piece is we've also seen it at local elections, right? We've seen it in Chicago elections where uh, there are aldermanic districts that are, you know, heavily, um, heavily contested. There might be a lot of spending. And all of a sudden, candidates are posting on their Twitter pages, uh, you know, here are the instructions that I have for, you know, these super PACs to run these ads. And then those ads show up two days later, right? So the, we see all of that kind of trickle down. And then the question is like, okay, can we actually address that? And uh, I think, you know, Congress was mentioned earlier and kind of the problems of gridlock. Uh, we certainly have problems with gridlock at the state and local level, but sometimes you actually do find um, you know, that the the state legislature or the, you know, city council or the county government is actually interested in taking action on that. Um, and I'll get to those in a little bit. Um, but the, uh, but there are other issues that we have to deal with at the state and local level too, right? Um, 501c4s do lots of spending at the state and local level. Um, dark money is certainly, you know, this the money that is spent without disclosing where it's coming from. Wealthy special interests certainly are putting their money into these shell games to route their money through 501c4s and LLCs and other groups that don't disclose their donors before they actually get spent in those state elections. And at the state level, there are very few places uh, that actually do have something in place to deal with that and actually provide meaningful disclosure of that spending for voters so that they have that information. Um, that that is like those are definitely two of the big issues at the state um, and local level, and one other one I want to highlight in particular is that's a little bit different from some of the federal issues we've been talking about so far, and it's actually foreign spending in elections. Um, foreign spending in elections, uh, you know, is addressed by federal law, right? There's a federal law that's very clear that foreign nationals cannot spend in uh, federal elections state elections or local elections. And that goes all the way down. It's one of the few federal laws that actually regulates, you know, state and local campaigns in some way. Um, that's, you know, an important, you know, protection against foreign interference in our elections, uh, but it does have at the state and local level some gaps, right? Because at the federal level, we don't have ballot measures. Right, the, you know where where people get to have direct democracy, um, you know, in their general election or in their elections, however that's going. Uh, but at the state and local level, those things happen all the time, and the federal law doesn't apply to those. The federal ban doesn't actually address foreign national spending to influence a ballot measure election in a state or in a county or something like that. And we've seen examples of it, right? Um, in 2020 and 2022, the last few years in Maine, there have been millions and millions of dollars spent by foreign owned uh, or foreign controlled um, uh, public utilities because there are you know, important issues in Maine that were on the ballot that were related to their issues. But you basically had Canadian crown corporations routing millions of dollars through US subsidiaries and then spending those millions of dollars to drown out the voices of main voters. That was a huge problem. And, and, and it was a surprise to a lot of people to find out that a Canadian owned, um, like a Canada, a Canadian government owned corporation could spend so directly in a main election. Uh, and so that's one issue. Um, the other issue is 
there are other ways that foreign influence can come into our elections, right? Um, it doesn't have to just be a foreign government or a foreign corporation spending directly, but it could be that a foreign corporation owns or a foreign corporation um, or a foreign national, I should say more broadly, uh, actually owns a company or owns um, you know, a significant amount of a company so that they can influence the policy decisions of that corporation here in the U.S., and then that corporation is going to spend money to influence elections in the U.S. that impact the interests of those foreign nationals, right? So there's a connection there that goes from those foreign national, that foreign national influence through the corporate spending to the elections here. And that's another gap that needs to be addressed. And some places are taking action to address those issues. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so I know you said we'll come back in a moment to what sorts of solutions we're seeing at the state and local level. But I want to go back to Kevin for a moment. You know, I think you and Sarav both talked about the problems of the Federal Election Commission not updating the law or not enforcing the law. And I'm sure many of our um, you know, guests today are just not having a hard time understanding if the Supreme Court has said it's supposed to be this way, how does the FEC get away with not actually interpreting the law as, as you know, the, the highest court in the land has said it's supposed to be interpreted? So can you talk a little bit, Kevin, about what um, CLC and, and other groups are doing to address these failures by the Federal Election Commission and, and, and other groups who exploit the lack of enforcement? Uh, sure. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, I so I think you could describe three general things that groups, watchdogs like CLC, uh, try to do to try to um, kind of improve enforcement and to encourage enforcement of the law in this area. Um, the first is, you know, we act as a watchdog. We monitor the campaign finance space. Um, we look at disclosure filings that are filed with the Federal Election Commission. Uh, to look for potential violations. Other groups do that, reporters do that, and then report on uh, potential violations in the media, um, all of which highlights the importance of disclosure, right? If, if there isn't disclosure of spending on our elections, um, it becomes much, much harder to detect potential violations. Um, and so uh, part of our role monitoring this space is to, to shine a light on potential violations when they're uncovered um, and to kind of direct the public's attention um, to what is actually happening and how money is being spent in the country's elections. Um, the second thing we do is, um, you know, we'll, we'll often act on the information by filing a complaint with the Federal Election Commission. Um, the FEC has a process, an enforcement process, where any mem member of the public can file a complaint with the FEC uh, alleging that someone has violated the campaign finance laws. And this triggers a process, an internal process inside the commission where um, the agency's Office of General Counsel will examine the alleged violation, uh, make recommendations to the commission on whether the commission should uh, pursue enforcement uh, given the allegations. And um, you know, the kind of end point of that process is the commission is empowered to uh, seek a settlement agreement with an alleged violator if the commission agrees that there was likely a violation in a particular case, or if they're unable to come to a settlement with an alleged violator, to, uh, the, the agency can actually go into federal court and sue that person, that entity, to enforce the campaign finance laws. Um, the, so by filing an FEC complaint, we bring a, a violation to the agency's attention and then um, you know, hope that the agency will run with that and, and enforce the law. Um, the third bucket is the groups like Campaign Legal Center or other entities that are harmed when the law is not enforced can file lawsuits uh, seeking enforcement of the campaign finance laws. Um, the FEC is pretty unique uh, in that, you know, most of the time, prosecutors, agencies, that, that are in charge of prosecuting violations of the law, whether it be civil or criminal, um, kind of have complete discretion whether or not to bring charges or seek enforcement um, against alleged violators. But Congress, I think, recognized that the FEC was unique given its six commissioner structure. Again, three Democrats, three Republicans. You have this heightened risk of deadlock, of the agency not agreeing on, on moving forward in a lot of cases. 
And so Congress put in this provision that allows groups like CLC to file a lawsuit against the commission, effectively asking a federal court to require the commission to, to act and to go forward um, and, and pursue a complaint that we filed with the agency. Um, and so that's another kind of tool in our two toolbox. When appropriate, we'll file such lawsuits against the agency. Um, and it is possible in these lawsuits that courts can say, yes, we agree, the FEC has acted contrary to the law. Um, we're going to require the agency to go forward. And if it doesn't, then the law authorizes groups like CLC um, to actually file their own lawsuit directly against the alleged violator who violated the campaign finance laws and to pursue um, remedies for those violations in a private action in that case. And, and um, you know, there, so there have been cases and we're litigating suits right now where um, we have pursued that and we are suing violators directly. Um, just to, to give one example, to make it a little bit more real, um, we represent Giffords, uh, the gun safety organization headed by Gabrielle Giffords in a lawsuit against the NRA for allegedly violating the campaign finance laws. Um, and this started with us filing a complaint with the FEC. Um, the, the FEC didn't act uh, on that complaint, so we filed suit. A federal court said, you know, we agree and we authorize you to go ahead and, and pursue the violation directly. So we now have this lawsuit against the NRA um, where we've alleged that the NRA coordinating coordinated a lot of spending in an election with um candidates who favor deregulating um gun laws which is contrary to the interests of our client um giffords and so we're pursuing that litigation right now thanks kevin um so aaron what is happening at the state and local level. And I know I mentioned at the very beginning that we had a exciting, um, you know, late breaking development um, of a court decision. So maybe you can tell everyone a little bit about that and, and other areas where we're actually seeing some um, success at the state and local level. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a great place to start. I actually, um, you can tell I have a hard time talking about the problems without starting to get into the solutions that we're seeing um because that's what that's what makes me a little bit more excited about this at the state and local level we do see wins happening um and they're real wins right they're durable and you know the work that that we do at campaign legal center and the work that we do with our partners you know in state and in you know, state agencies state groups local groups um, you know, that really can come together to create these wins that that do result in, you know, uh, more transparency for voters and, you know, a chance for voters to actually have their voice heard. The big one is in Arizona. Um, Arizona, two years ago, passed a law uh, that, you know, we helped with, we helped design um, and consulted with folks there, worked closely with folks in Arizona to uh, develop it. And then, you know, they got it passed. It was a huge win uh, because it was a big transparency measure that was designed to prevent wealthy special interests from playing their shell games, right? What it did is it said, if you're a big spender in Arizona elections and you're taking in big contributions from, you know, groups that don't disclose their donors, like 501c4s or LLCs or others, then you have to actually trace back that money from back to its original source, right? Report the original source so that, you know, whoever's down there at the end of the line, you know, spending millions of dollars and trying to hide their identity, you know, they can't do that in Arizona elections. They have to be reported. Uh, and that's the key piece, um, you know, that we're getting, we call it, you know, trace back or original source disclosure, because that's really what's happening. We're talking about not just the political committees that have names like Americans for Apple Pie, right? Like that, you know, when someone says paid for by Americans for Apple Pie, we don't necessarily really know what's going on there. Uh, where's that money coming from? Uh, but when we know who the spender is, who's the, where that money is actually coming from, we can better assess, you know, what that spending is, um, is trying to do. We can better assess the advertisements because uh, the messenger matters, right? Uh, so the big win today is that that law was upheld 
yet again in federal court um, that the law has been challenged by a number of um, plaintiffs in Arizona, both in state court and in federal court. And it's been upheld before in state court. And now it's been upheld in federal court uh, today where the judge in the court was very clear that Arizona has a strong governmental interest, right, in ensuring that voters have the information they need uh, to be able to, you know, make their choices when they're filling out their ballots. Um, voters, right, like we said before, have a right to know all that information about who's trying to influence their vote. And so that's the big win today that, you know, something that started years ago with colleagues um, here at CLC, many colleagues working together on this. Um, and so getting that big win, uh, you know, is good for the future because it's it means that we can keep working on these solutions. Um, we've also seen similar things in Alaska. There's a similar law in Alaska that's been upheld. Um, and then there are efforts across the country that um, that folks have fo uh, worked on, places like Illinois, places like Maine, places like Hawaii, where bills have been introduced. Um, they haven't gotten over the you know over the finish line, but you know this, it is a process that takes some time. Uh, so that's the biggest sort of transparency win. Um, and that's a place where we can take some inspiration. Um, I do also want to highlight a couple other wins, um, mostly because uh, I can't stop talking about public financing, um, public financing of elections. Uh, you know, if, if folks aren't familiar with it, right, it's basically making sure that uh, candidates who may not otherwise have resources to run for office can access funds to help them run a competitive campaign. Um, and the big innovations in the last few years have been focusing on small dollar donor uh, focused programs, right? So things like matching programs, where if I give $20 to a candidate, you know, that small donation will get uh, matched, you know, five to one, six to one, seven to one. I think the highest I've seen is nine to one uh, in Denver, which is one of the most recent programs to go into place. Um, they ran their first election under that program last year, and it was a it was a big success. There are lots of candidates who were able to run. Um, but what it does is it changes the calculus for a lot of candidates because all of a sudden they don't need to rely on those big spenders anymore. They don't need to rely on wealthy networks with big donors in order to raise funds for their um, for their campaign. They can instead go to the folks who are in their districts. Um, who are able to give those $20 donations, those $50 donations, get those matched and turn those into meaning, really just changes the um, incentives there. So the um, so that's one aspect of it. And then the other one that's coming up is uh, something that's called democracy vouchers. So with the democracy voucher system, which is one, the one that has been innovated in Seattle, uh, that's one where every registered voter in the district gets a, a, what they call a democracy voucher. It has a value of $25. They get four of them, and they can give them to any candidate who, who's qualified for the program. Uh, and those candidates can go to those folks and say, oh, yeah, you can give me your voucher. That'll be a meaningful contribution to my campaign. Um, and then, again, it makes sure that you're putting... Uh, you're putting, you know, some control back in the hands of the voters, of the folks who are actual constituent constituents of um, candidates, as opposed to, you know, the wealthy special interests who might want to be, you know, spending a million dollars in a campaign that is a 500 miles away from where they live or a thousand miles away from where they live. Um, so those are the, those kinds of programs really do kind of turn a lot of the problems that we've been talking about into kind of a different question, right? How do we actually focus on bringing more people in, right? Giving them the opportunity to make small donations that are meaningful in campaigns, um, making sure that voters actually have, you know, some some sort of like, you know, empowerment, I think is the, the way to put it, uh, to participate in campaigns. Because I think it can be easy to be, you know, a little bit, um, uh, dispirited by seeing that someone gave a $50,000 donation, $100,000 donation, when you can't do that, right? It doesn't feel like you really have much of a voice anymore. But putting these 
programs in place have shown that they do increase participation. They ensure, in fact, that groups that historically haven't been able to participate in elections, uh, often women, people of color, uh, those folks actually participate at higher rates when there's public financing available that they can participate in. And that works for both the candidate side and it works for the voter side uh, who want to make those contributions. Uh, so those are the those are the exciting wins uh, that I wanted to highlight. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so I'm going to pause um, the our discussion for a moment because I see we have a number of questions um, in the Q&A box and we have about 10 minutes or so left. Um, and so I'm going to answer a question um, that I think Sarab, or I, I, let me pose a question to Sarab. Um, and I, this sounds like something that I know um, is certain aspects of it are on a lot of people's minds in light of um, a lot of what's been talked about in the press recently. So uh, Michael James asks if fundraising entities like the RNC and the DNC and super PACs have to disclose what they're raising money for, or what they're spending money on, and if funds are allowed to be used for non-promotional or advocacy purposes, such as, for example, legal fees. Um, this has come up quite a bit in the context of um, former President Trump, who is reportedly spending PAC money to pay for legal fees or potentially even um, hit a bond in one of his cases. And so can you um, tell us about the disclosure of money spent by these organizations and also what they're allowed to use their money on. Sure, definitely. Yeah, this is coming up a lot uh, in, in current events. Um, so basically the requirement is that they, all, all political committees, whether it's a, a party committee like the RNC or a super PAC uh, or a candidate's campaign committee, uh, they all have to disclose where they're getting their money from and how they're spending it. So to the extent that uh, any of these entities is spending money on legal fees or a bond for, for someone like former President Trump, that would be visible in their filings, in their disclosures that they have to file with the FEC. Um, I think the more interesting question in some ways is, is this even possible? Is this something that they can do? Uh, because, you know, this uh, type of spending is obviously very different from campaigning for office uh, or, or trying to get someone elected to to office. Uh, so the general rule is that uh, campaign contributions cannot be used uh, for personal use. So uh, candidates have quite a bit of uh, flexibility and leeway in terms of how they choose to use their money, but they can't use it to pay for personal expenses. And in the context of something like legal fees or, or a bond, uh, what that means is they can only use campaign contributions to pay for that uh, if there's some nexus between the, the legal expenses and either their campaign or their official duties in office. So to give you an illustration of how that works, uh, the cases like the E. Jean Carroll defamation suit or the New York Attorney General civil fraud suit are basically have no nexus with Trump uh, campaigning for office or serving as president. Whereas by contrast, uh, the the suits, the, the criminal actions that have been brought based on things that he might have done in office or things he might have done when he was campaigning, those at least have the required nexus that uh, he could use campaign money to pay those expenses. The I think the other big caveat here is that the, uh, the rule I just described, the personal use prohibition, uh, applies to candidates' campaigns. It does not, according to the FEC, uh, it does not extend to leadership PACs. And so what that means is that Save America, the, the main leadership PAC that Trump has been using to pay his legal fees, uh, is not governed by that personal use prohibition. And so as a result, Trump has been using that entity to pay his legal fees and, and um, you know, sort of irrespective of whether it has that nexus to his campaign or not. Though I hear that's running out of money, so it's still a problem. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, Kevin, I'm going to ask you to take this next one. So um, the question is, doesn't the president of the United States appoint the head of the FEC? So can you talk about how what the process is for appointing um, FEC commissioners and 
and why we have ended up in the situation we have. Sure, yeah. Um, so the NPC is a, a little bit unusual, a little bit different from like a normal agency that say is headed up by just one person, like a chair. Um, it, so it's an independent federal commission, which means it's a little bit more insulated from any particular administration than a usual agency. And, and so, yes, it is true that the president does um, kind of nominate uh, commissioners who are then approved um, by the Senate. Although, practically speaking, the commissioners tend to really be chosen by their respective party leadership, who then put them up for approval to the administration. And, um, and you know, I think it's fair to say that generally the, the, the nominees put up by party leadership are then approved, even if the president happens to be of the opposite party, because there's a bit of a reciprocity there, right? Like they're, the president's party also wants their people on the commission. Um, once the commissioners are on the commission, they serve uh, a term of, I believe it's seven years, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think the, the default term for commissioners is, is seven or eight years, somewhere in that area. Um, and so, so commissioners will serve out that term. They can often serve beyond that term if they're not then replaced by an administration. But, you know, you have, you have had commissioners who have been on the commission for a very long time and have seen many administrations. Um, and so there is a bit of um, more of a distance there between the commission, uh, insulation rather, between the members of the commission and any particular administration. And again, that, you know, this independent aspect of the commission um, was created by Congress and intended again to, to make sure that the commission would be enforcing the law in a bipartisan fashion. It looks like Kevin might have frozen. Um, so I'm gonna come back to him in a minute, but um, in the meantime, I'm gonna ask Sarab, somebody's asking about whether we've seen any litigation or, or lawsuits over the red boxing issue. So uh, sure, the, you know, red boxing is something that, uh, I don't think we've seen litigation over that specific issue. Uh, it's an area where the FEC has taken the position that that's simply not uh, coordination under its coordination rules. And so uh, in essence, they, they've taken the position that, you know, it's, it's not illegal in the first place. Um, I think it, it would be challenging given that position that they've, they've taken uh, to try and actually say, well, you're, you know, that they're wrong about that and that that actually is coordination. Um, what we hope for in instead as a sort of uh, alternative to tackle the problem of red boxing is to get Congress to uh, actually implement new coordination rules. The the FEC is relying on, on its regulations, which the FEC is in charge of implementing, uh, but those regulations have to be consistent with and, and comport with the statute that Congress has um, has passed. And so if Congress actually goes in and uh, defines coordination in a more comprehensive and meaningful way, uh, and actually can even specifically uh, outlaw red boxing by describing kind of how it works and saying that that constitutes coordination, um, then I think the law would actually be able to to grapple with the problem and, and uh, you know, the FEC would uh, have to revise its position on, on uh, whether red boxing is legal. Thanks. Um, Kevin, did you want to finish <laughs> your answer? Sorry that we, we lost you for a moment there. Sure, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Not sure what happened. But um, yeah, I think uh, the last point I was making is just that DOJ today has authority over criminal enforcement of the campaign finance laws. Uh, but the FEC has exclusive authority over any civil enforcement. And again, the, the point of the structure and the nature of the commission was that such enforcement would be uh, bipartisan and you could not have partisan enforcement of the campaign finance laws. Um, 
I think there was one more question that I, I, um, I think is important for us to answer, and then maybe we can take a minute for um, each of you to share your what you're sort of keeping an eye out for this year. But Kevin, I'm going to go back to you on this one. Someone's asking whether campaign finance reform is enough to address the concerns about you know voter participation and, and voter, voters' voices being heard, or whether we need to reform the entire elect, election system, including voting rights and redistricting and all this. And, you know, as a person who works in all of these different areas, um, I know that you have thoughts on this topic. Um, sure, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think reforms across the board are really critical and that, um, you know, there are many areas in which CLC is actively pursuing reforms, including voting rights and redistricting. Um, we're supportive of ranked choice voting. I mean, we, we think a lot of these reforms are critical and they do Kind of address discrete problems in our elections today um, that campaign finance reform on its own would not necessarily address. Although, of course, um, we think you know the problems in this area uh, are critically important, and um, various reforms would would go a very long way to improving our elections. Thanks. Um, so before we wrap up and I turn it back over to Jenny, I just wanted to give, well, thank you all again for taking the time to share your expertise and experience with everyone here um, and give you another you know, minute or so to just share if there's something you're really keeping an eye out for this year as we head into um, what is sure to be a um, highly watched and um, contentious presidential election year. Um, and Aaron, I'll start with you. Thank you. I think, you know, the one thing I wanted to add after Sarav's uh, discussion of red boxing again was just that there are solutions out there again. Um, Philadelphia is a place that's passed uh, a red boxing rule. They've enacted one to basically put an end to it and make sure that red boxing is considered coordination and, and subject to the um, subject to the contribution limits and all that stuff in Philadelphia, that's really important because it provides a model, right? When we're talking about laboratories of democracy, we're talking about things at the state and local level that people are gonna try out and start bubbling those up to Congress and hopefully uh, maybe up to the FEC if they <laughs> if they can get around to it. Um, and so that's one that that I'm keeping an eye on because I'd like to see more of that, right? I'd like to see more folks taking on red boxing um, that could be done at the state level, that can be done at the local level. Um, so that's one That's one thing. And then the other thing I'm keeping an eye on is how these, transparency, these new transparency laws are working, right? Arizona has their new law working. Alaska has their law working. How do we make sure that uh, folks are actually getting that information about who's spending in those elections, making sure voters have that information, and then being able to take those lessons to other places and say, here are the transparency lessons we've learned in Arizona. How do you think we can make it work in other places? Great. Um, Sarah, what are you looking out for this year? Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, I mean, all of what we've talked about with regard to secret spending, as well as coordination, you know, every election cycle, it seems to get worse and worse. And, you know, with the amount of money being spent continuing to increase, uh, it's definitely bo both of those problems seem to be uh, as as present as ever. And so, you know, part of what we do is we try to flag violations for the FEC and we try to use, you know, examples of things that aren't violations, but we think should be uh, in our advocacy work. Um, but sort of actually against the backdrop of all these other campaign finance problems that have been around for a while, one thing that's very brand new and very frightening uh, that, that I'm almost hesitant to mention uh, in, in the waning minutes that we have is uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, this is a brand new frontier for the ways in which uh, campaign communications are are being put together. Uh, it's very scary to think about, you know, seeing ads, seeing seeing or hearing um, communications that pretend to be candidates or pretend to be election officials, uh, but are actually complete fabrications. Um, I think the the potential misuse of these tools is a real threat, and it's good to see that Congress uh, has become has been cognizant of the threat and. 
Uh, there are actually two bills in Congress already that address the use of deceptive AI or the use of AI in, in any kind of uh, election-related communications. Um, and they're both bipartisan bills. So uh, even for uh, a moment where we see you know, Congress doing very, very little and sort of uh, bogged down in, in partisan gridlock, um, I think Congress on, on both sides of the aisle can see the fundamental danger that AI presents to our electoral process. So um, that's something we we all should be keeping an eye on in, in this cycle and uh, the cycles to come. Okay, and Kevin, you get the last word. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I think 2024 could be a really big year for important court rulings in the campaign finance space. Um, so I would say, you know, keep an eye on CLC's litigation docket um, and, and our campaign finance cases. I think we we could see a number of important court rulings that might bring important clarity to area important areas of the law in the campaign finance space. The two big ones being really when does a nonprofit that spends on elections have to register with the FEC as a political committee? And again, the reason why that's so important is this is political committees have to disclose their donors and their spending to the public via the FEC. Um, and so there, there could be a, a you know much needed disclosure um, as a result of potential court rulings. And the other the other big issue is coordination. Um, as as Saraf so well explained, um, you know, the rules are a little muddled and it, it, you know there could be court rulings that bring again important clarity to when it is that independent spending is coordinated with the candidate. And again, that's important because as soon as it's coordinated, that means it's actually a contribution um, and contributions can cause or lead to corruption. Um, and so um, I would keep an eye on, on the courts in 2024. Kevin, Jenny, back to you. Aaron, thanks. Aaron, do you wanna share your email address, uh, the CLC's email address for any other questions? Yes. Um, where do I put that in the, how do I do that? I, just, I would just voice it right now. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so if we haven't gotten a chance to answer a question that you posed in the Q and A box, or if you think of a new question that you have for us, please shoot them our way at, um, info, I N F O at campaign org, And we will do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. That's great. Thanks. Aaron, Sarav, Kevin, and Aaron, thank you and the Campaign Legal Center for sharing your expertise tonight. Uh, this is just another great program, and I hope uh, you'll come back because I, I think the conversation can certainly continue. Our next NFRPP program will be on Thursday, April 11th at 7.30 p.m. The topic will be Returning to Philadelphia, Amending the Constitution for the 21st Century. Please plan to join us. Watch your email for a brief survey on tonight's program. Your in input helps shape future programs. Thank you all and see you on April 11th. Good night, everybody.